Uh, good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, we're delighted to welcome you to our fall gardening program on growing orchids. As part of the Friends mission, we want to help educate and inspire gardeners to become more confident in their endeavors. Our fall series includes lectures on dahlias, which we had in September, and it was amazing. Um, just a few weeks ago, we had a program on African violets. Tonight, of course, is orchids with Dr. Kay Perry. And um, next month, we have a program on growing your own mushrooms. So visit our website to learn more about those programs and how to register. Let me share with you, a lot of you are probably familiar with the Oak Park Conservatory, but I always like to introduce you if you're not familiar. Um, did you know the Oak Park Conservatory began as a community effort to house exotic plants collected during tra travels abroad? Built in 1929, it is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It's free to the public and has about 50,000 visitors annually and offers a rich atmosphere throughout three indoor showrooms featuring more than 3,000 types of plants. The Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory were the nonprofit that supports the Park District owned conservatory. We offer programs such as this focused on enriching the visitor experience to the conservatory and um, additional volunteer opportunities year round. So from kids programs to adults, we have something educational and rooted in nature for everybody. As a member of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, you can take advantage of the American Horticulture Society's Reciprocal Admissions Program. The Reciprocal Admissions Program offers free admission and or additional benefits to over 350 gardens throughout North America. A membership to the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory can take you well beyond Oak Park now. So please consider joining the Friends and supporting us with your membership. And there's my Be a Friend um, message. So let me shift gears and um, spotlight our speaker and presenter tonight. Um, Kay Perry received her PhD in biochemistry from Northwestern University. She started growing orchids in graduate school and has since expanded from one orchid purchased at the Evanston Farmer's Market to more than 800 orchids. She grows over 35 different genera of orchids in her Oak Park home. Dr. Perry is a member of the Illinois Orchid Society Amer and the American Orchid Society, and she's also a student in the American Orchid Society judging program. So we're excited to have her joining us tonight. And I also want to in introduce Kayla Chase. Kayla Chase, who, as you know, is my partner in crime in all these lectures. She's our membership chair at the Friends. She's also a master gardener. And um, she will be taking all your questions in the chat box and we'll consolidate them and ask them um, to Kay as we go throughout the program. So at this time, um, we would like to ask Kay to share her screen and unmute, and we'll get started. Am I muted? You're good. We can hear you. Okay, good. I was like, I didn't think I had muted my own. Uh, all right. So, um, yes, I'm a member of the Illinois Orchid Society. I am the former home show chair for the Illinois Orchid Society, which means that I helped um, our members arrange to show our orchids to the Chicago land public twice a year at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. Um, if you count it up, I've been growing orchids about 21 years. Um, I, everyone else in the world, um, when they get pregnant and have a baby, they decorate the baby's room, the nursery. I went and bought a plant and then I bought more plants because apparently getting pregnant meant that I had to buy a lot of plants. Um, I switched to growing orchids um, from bonsai. I started growing bonsai in graduate school and I was at school too much and my bonsai kept dying because I'd forget to do things like watering them. So I wanna say that orchids are much, much easier than bonsai. They're not as fussy. And as you can basically get these orchids like everywhere now, you can see that it's really um, boomed as a hobby for everyone. Um, it's not just something that you have to have a greenhouse to grow, you can grow them in your own home. And so this is basically a, a short, hopefully short talk about um, growing orchids in your home. And I wanted to start with uh, some introduction about orchids in and of themselves. 
So if I can make this play, um, this is a, a, a long poster by um, the FTD florists about uh, different types of orchids. Uh, we think about orchids as one, but there are really 28,000 different species of orchids in the world. That means there's 700 different genera. And in my home of seven to 800 orchids, I have 35 different genera alone. However, when you go to um, the store, like you go to Trader Joe's, you go to Home Depot, you go to Lowe's, there's basically one kind of orchid that is found. And you can see all the orchids scrolling past. Guess what? We have not gotten to that one orchid that you find at Trader Joe's yet. <laughs> it is at the very bottom of this video. And um, let's see if we can come along, get to it. I tried to make it slower because it was really blurry when I let it run faster. <laughs> so I slowed it down. So the orchid that everybody sees when you go to Trader Joe's or you know Home Depot or you go to Jewel or whatever is this, the Phalaenopsis right here. And just to show that it is, you see a display of orchids right here. I took this picture two weeks ago at Tony's when I was buying my groceries. So this is what you go in, they're $19.99, right? They come in the cellophane and a little pot, right? And you can just get a Phalaenopsis. So all those different kinds of genres that I just told you exist out there, I'm not gonna talk about them tonight. All the information that I'm gonna give you tonight is gonna be about growing a Phalaenopsis or a fowl, as we um, people who grow lots of orchids tend to call them. So the um, all orchids, including a fowls, are epiphytes. And what is an epiphyte? An epiphyte is a plant that grows on another plant. So you can see right here, I have, um, these are orchids right here and they're growing on this tree branch, right? So they grow on branches um, in the canopy of uh, the tropical forest and the understory. And if you're wondering where that is, here are the layers of a rainforest. So in a rainforest, you have the emergent layer. This is the top layer of the rainforest where um, new growth happens, the tops of the trees. You have the forest floor right here, which is no, you know, you're like underbrush, the bushes, um, well, small bushes, like uh, there's not really grass, but the trice, the leaf litter and everything. And then you have the canopy layer, which is sort of like the branches. And then the understory layers where you see like vines, um, taller bushes, maybe slightly shorter trees. And it's this layer that the orchids grow in, right? So it's in these two layers. Some orchids grow higher up in the canopy and some orchids grow lower down in the understory. And the ones that grow in the canopy um, like more light and the ones that grow in the underscore story like less light. But you, it's like a gradient. But what you should really take away from this is that orchids don't grow out in full sun. They don't grow in the emergent layer. They are shaded plants. And so, I wanted, I have this video from when I went to Costa Rica um, a few years ago and I walked around the um, slightly like tropical um, grounds of, of the resort that I was staying at. And this very beginning part, um, I basically, I'm trying to find an orchid in the trees. So I'm just gonna share that part with you. If I can get my mouse over there, just start it. No, I can't. Let me see if it's going to go. I decided to go around buying the plants up, lodge, and look for orchids. And uh, the staff knows that I like orchids, and so they have told me that there are orchids high in the trees. So that's how tall the trees are. And if you look right there, I'm zooming in. That's an orchid right there in the middle. That blurry thing is the orchid. Yeah. All right, so um, I just wanted to show how high you had to see how high I had to zoom. No, I want it to go on. Okay, that I had to zoom to go on, like to just show you how high up that the orchids were um, in those trees. So they're, they're attached to the tree trunks and the branches, right? And the branches, you don't have branches low down in a tropical rainforest, they're all way up high. So when you go into the tropical rainforest, you don't really see orchids down low. They're all way, way, up there. Um, 
So knowing that, so knowing that orchids grow in a tropical rainforest high up on the branches of the trees lets you know what you need in order to grow an orchid in your house. So orchids need three things. They need light, they need water, and they need the right temperature. And I'm gonna cover how you're gonna get each of these things in my Orchids 101. So where do you put your orchid, right? We're gonna talk about light there. When do you water? How much do you water? Because that second thing they need, water. What temperature do you keep your orchid at? So then you've covered the three things they need to grow out. And then with that, you'll, you wonder, okay, how long are these flowers gonna last that I just brought home from Trader Joe's? What do I need to do to rebloom that orchid? And everybody always wants to know, uh, uh, when do I repot my orchid? Because people seem to want to bring their orchid home and repot it right away. So those are the things that I'm going to cover in this. Um, the Phalaenopsis is a, like I said, a low light orchid. So it's growing up in those trees. It's not, it actually tends to grow closer down in the understory versus um, up you know, closer to the top in the, in, in the canopy. Um, as a low light orchid, it doesn't need more than two to three hours of direct sunlight. So if you buy an orchid and you talk to someone who grows a lot of orchids, they're gonna tell you that you should put it in some place that has indirect light. This does not mean it can't take direct light, but it doesn't want very much of it. And for that reason, what I recommend for fowls are to grow them on your windowsills. It just makes them great that you can sell them at Trader Joe's and then bring them home into your house. You want a windowsill with bright indirect light. And of those in an Oak Park house, the best exposures are gonna be an Eastern or Southern exposure, right? For a few hours um, of sun every day, you don't really wanna do Western exposures. Those are a little bit too hot. And then, um, the northern exposure in most houses, they're okay in the summer because, you know, we have long days in the summer, but usually in the winter, that's not going to be enough light. And you can tell if your orchid is getting enough light based on the color of the leaves. So for your Phalaenopsis, if it's got really super, super deep, rich, dark green leaves, it's not getting enough light. And that might be a reason that it doesn't bloom for you. Um, you want it to be not like, you know, pale, pale green, but you want it to be a lighter green color. You don't want your Phalaenopsis leaves to be really super dark green. So that's how much light you need, just a couple hours in an Eastern or Southern window. So watering, so you get it enough light, it's sitting in your window, but now you have to water it so it doesn't dry out. So the way to know how much water to give you orchid is that you have to know what's in the pot. So remember the first thing that I said is that the orchid's an epiphyte. It grows on trees on top of other plants. So in the wild, they're not in pots. They're not in anything. They're not in soil. They're hanging out on the trees. Their roots spread out all naked everywhere. And that's how they like it. Their roots absorb water from the air. Most of us don't live in an environment where you could take a big hose and spray the orchid against your wall. So we have a pot. The pot is not for the orchid. The pot is for you. So you need to know what's in the pot, which will help you decide how to water it. Most commercially produced orchids come in one of two mixes. They either come in the bark mix, which is on the left, which is composed of um, fir bark, sphagnum moss, and perlite. The fir bark um, is like the substrate that the orchids can wrap its roots around. The sphagnum moss helps hold water in, and the perlite helps make air. Remember, these are plants that grow in air, and so they want to have a lot of space in their medium. The other thing that a lot of commercially um, produced orchids come in, that fowls come in, is sphagnum moss. And the sphagnum moss is, can be very dense. It holds a lot of water. So commercial growers love sphagnum moss because it means that they can water the orchids less. So if it's in bark, you're gonna water more. And if it's in sphagnum moss, you're gonna water less. So 
Um, did I cover this already? Yes, they take water out of the air and um, they, you want it, the, the substrate's there to keep the orchids humid, but not sopping wet. Remember, epiphyte in the air, if the substrate is completely soaked, the water's filling all the air holes, then the orchid roots can't breathe and they will suffocate and die. So you can have them in both the bark mix and the sphagnum moss, they will grow just fine, but you wanna water less than when it's in moss and more when it's in bark. And I have right here, um, my, my rough for an Oak Park house in the winter, I like to say this, is that, um, and even in the summer, because we all hopefully, most of us have air conditioning and are not suffering through the summer here roasting. Um, I say about seven days, you water it every seven days when it's in bark, and you wanna water it every, about every 10 days um, when it's in moss. And this is really gonna kind of depend on what your ambient humidity is. So I say that if you have, th those, those numbers are really good. You have like about 50% humidity in your house. So if you have a whole house humidifier in the winter, that's gonna work for you. But if you like me have radiator heat, right? I have, I have what's hot water heat, which is not very humid. Then the humidity in my house in the winter, when I have the heat on and it's like minus 20 outside, it's 30%. And when it's 30% of the water, I water my orchids twice a week. <laughs> It's because it, it will get dry really, really fast. Um, the other thing is that how do you want to water is that I have that you soak the medium and then you allow the orchid to dry. So if you have just one orchid, you can take it to your sink. You can run water into the pot. You let it flow through. You put it down in the bottom of your sink. You let it drain out. And then you take your orchid back to the windowsill where it's living. And that's great if you have one orchid. Um, if you have more, like 800, I don't do that because if I had to take 800 orchids one by one to the sink, it would never happen. Um, so other things you can do if you have a lot of orchids, uh, you don't have to take them each one by one to the sink, but you can water them from the bottom. So they're sitting in a saucer. You can fill that saucer with like a half inch of water and you can let it soak up right? That lets you water, what I call watering the media, right? The same thing when you run the water through the pot and you let it drain out, but you just let it soak up, right? About a half inch. You don't want to have it standing in water for a really long period of time because of then again, um, suffocation for the roots. So you don't want it to like, you don't want to put it like, you know how some people talk about soaking plants um, and you soak the whole pot all the way down. You just put some in that saucer that's sitting underneath your, your orchid pot. Um, if you have one of those cash pots, those decorative cash pots that they come in, the ceramic, and then it, your, your orchid's actually in one of those little plastic sleeves inside, then with those, what I usually recommend is that you can add like maybe a half to a quarter cup of water, right? You can let it sit in there and then you can pull out the little plastic insert, dump the excess water out, put it back, put it back in your window. Um, you just don't want to really, you don't want to like say fill that little ceramic pot all the way up to the top of the water and let it sit like that. Um, not more than like say, you know, maybe five minutes because some people seem as much as 15 minutes, but, but you're, you will suffocate the orchid by, by just soaking it in water too long. They don't want to be waterlogged like that. Um, one of the things you don't want to do on this is that you do not want to water the top of the orchid. So in the wild, yes, it rains. Um, they're on the trees, often they're tilted and the rain will run out of the leaves or the crown of the orchid. Um, but that doesn't happen as much because we like to have nice upright orchids in our homes. So where is the crown? The crown is the area that I have circled right there in red. And what happens when you water from the top is that water will sit in the little cup right there and then um, if it gets cold, like it cool, it's cooler after you watered, then it's easy for bacteria to invade and you'll get what's called crown rot. And then basically the top turns black and then your orchid stem turns black and then all your leaves fall off. So here's a picture of what it looks like when it starts turning black. Um, when your orchid looks like that, what I usually tell people is that 
Uh, it's, it's, you know, that orchid was like, what, $12.99, $19.99 at Trader Joe's, just go get another one. Don't try to save it. You, you can try, but it's hard and it's much easier to go to Trader Joe's and get a new one. <laughs> um, watering. So there is a company out there called the Just Add Ice um, Orchid Company, and they basically market their orchids of Hey, water with ice cubes, three ice cubes a week. And I'm going to tell you is the greatest marketing gimmick ever. Okay. First of all, in Chicago, in the winter, three ice cubes is so not enough water. Um, you need, your orchid's going to need enough water with 30% ambient humidity. The other thing is that orchids are tropical plants. So um, remember a tropical forest? Um, in, in the jungle, there are no ice cubes. And this is what happens if you water with ice cubes. So you can see right here that the tops of these roots are black. So when you get your ice cubes and you put it down on the orchid like that, um, they get what I like to call freezer burn. You're basically giving the or top of the orchid roots frostbite. You're freezing them, they turn black like this. And eventually this orchid will die. Now you're like, oh, but I've been watering with ice cubes and it's blooming and it's great. Oh, that's, this is why this is the greatest orchiding gimmick ever. Because orchids bloom as a last ditch effort to stay alive. So you're basically freezing them. They're desperate to stay alive. And so they bloom their little hearts out. And when those blooms die, the plant croaks. Um, and that's, <laughs> that's why, and then, they, uh, so you can see right here, they'll sometimes try to save themselves by uh, right here. You can see they put out new roots above, but you see the bottom part right here, it's all dying. It's all dead. It's not, see, these are plump and white. These air roots are all plump and white. And these roots are turning brown. They're shriveling up like this. They are just freezer burning and dying. So that is like the life cycle. So, so the orchid will try to save itself if you water it with ice cubes. It, that, it's not like it's gonna completely um, die. And what you can do with an orchid like this, if you are desperate to continue watering with ice cubes because you think it's the best thing ever, is if you keep putting your ice cubes down here or you've killed all the roots, it'll be okay because the live roots that are keeping the plant alive are up here. And then you're providing ambient humidity by melting that ice cube there. But basically everything down here in the pot You've murdered it. You've murdered it with your ice cubes. Um, the only way to successfully use ice cubes on an orchid is if you get one that's potted in the moss completely or the bark completely covers the roots and the ice cubes are only sitting on top. And then you have an insulation layer um, with the bark or the moss between your ice and the roots. But no, it's, it's just a really slow murder of the plant. Uh, and I, I always tell people that, that what, if you water with ice cubes, then, you know, in, in six months, you're going to go out and you're going to give just add ice orchids, like another $12.99 as you buy another plant. So let's, all right. So I covered where you put your orchid, um, when to water, right? And then we have what temperature to keep your orchid, right? Um, they're tropical plants, so they don't want to stay outside in the summer. And they are actually not what we call warm orchids. So warm orchids want to be like 80 to 95 degrees. Um, they're what we call intermediate to warm orchids. So they want to be between 65 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, which to me is basically your typical office. And this photo right here is my orchids in my office at work at Argonne National Lab. I have indoor air conditioning in the summer. I have a window um, that gives them light and they love it and they bloom like crazy and like it's totally temperature controlled. So if you can't keep orchids in your home and you are still going into work and not working remotely, they love offices. They love all that air conditioning. They think it's awesome. Um, and then, oh, I have a video right here to show you of my orchids at work. 
and how they're growing. So you can see a lot of them have their roots sticking out. They're in pots so I can water them. They're in little trays, which I fill with like my quarter inch of water and I like it soak up from the bottom because it's much faster than taking these all to the sink. And um, they're just sitting in my office under fluorescent lights and under a little, I have, it's a Western window and I have the shades partly down because it's a little bit too high. So, all right, yes, I'm covered. Light, water, temperature, and how long do flowers last? All right, so this is a continuation of like why the um, just add ice orchids is the greatest scam ever. Orchids will bloom, Phalaenopsis orchids, so not all orchids, but Phalaenopsis orchids will bloom up to six months. On average, they're in bloom three months. If you buy one that has been in bloom at the store, it's usually been in bloom probably around a month or so. So you'll get like easily two more months of bloom before the flowers die. And it takes so long to kill an orchid by watering with ice cubes that you think it's you when it's dead. So six months later, when that last flower falls off, you're like, Oh, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. You murdered it, starting with the ice cubes way back, but it's been trying to stay alive for you because Phalaenopsis orchids can bloom a really long time. Um, I mean, I don't have the absolute premium conditions in my workplace, but you know, they'll start blooming at Christmas and they'll bloom all the way to May. So you get months. It's great winter color. I, I can't, I just, I love having fowls at work. Um, but yes, they can bloom themselves to death. That last flower will fall off, you've murdered all the roots, and then it will just go, hey, all the, everything will shrivel, and you'll be like, why is it dead? Because you watered it with ice cubes. Don't do it. Um, how do you get your orchids to rebloom? So this is another photo from my work in the background right here. Um, I think it's one evening when I had to work late, and, but this is, um, it's probably around January, February, because everything's in bloom. Um, most things right now are just starting to go into bloom. And the way I make them bloom at my workplace is I move up against the windows right here. So they're right up against the window and that cools them down at night. And I use that to create a 10 degree difference between daytime and nighttime. And if you do that for about a month, they will spike and bloom. That's all they need. So the easiest way to do it in your house is you take that orchid, which I've already said, to be on the windowsill and you keep it right up against that windowsill in like October, November when it's getting cooler, this year a little later than in other years. And you'll start seeing spikes by November, uh, mid-November, because it only needs this 10 degree differential for about three to four weeks and they will start to spike. That's what you do. So if you keep it like in the inside of your house, like on a counter way away from the windows where you have it really temperature controlled and it's not overall temperature, it's a change in temperature between daytime and nighttime. If you keep it really controlled and it's the same temperature, they will not spike in bloom. So even orchids that don't get enough sun, if you change the temperature for them, they will bloom. So commercial growers, how do they do this? They use a lot of air conditioning. It's like they basically, to get them to spike in the summer, they refrigerate them a little bit and then they will spike and bloom. So they just, air conditioning is a wonderful thing. You can't do it in the tropics and the tropics they have to wait. But you know, around here, AC. So I can get a few orchids to bloom in the summer, right? I have a workplace that really runs the AC really hard and I get it up against the window. So it's warm during the day and it cools down at night with all that air conditioning running and they will spike. But um, it's really, really consistent around here for all of us who grow in our homes or at work if you just put them up against your window. Um, I almost always get great blooming right starting around Christmas. Um, it takes about a month for the spikes to form and then um, they start opening up. So I'll go away on Christmas vacation and I'll come back and they will all be open. Um, okay, so when your flowers um, are blooming, 
um, a lot of people will be like, um, it's done, should I cut the stem? And the answer to that is no. So if your stem is still green, then you want to cut it after or right before the last unbloomed node. And what is an unbloomed node? Let me see. This right here is an unbloomed node. So you can see that it makes like that little, what looks like a little divot in the straight stem. That's a node. Inside there is undifferentiated meristematic tissue that can become a, either a flower or a new spike like that could become a whole new stem of flowers. So what you want to do in this case is you would cut it like right there. So you have the, the node that has made, that has a flower and it's a bloomed node. And then this is the unbloomed node and you would cut it about one inch right in between. And you can see right here, that's what I did. So this dry bit right here was where I cut it, it had another stem that was going straight up. And then instead of making just one flower, it made a whole new stem that came out and is giving me four flowers right here. And this photo is from last week. So I basically had finished blooming and, and I cut it. And then I was like, um, I put it there all summer in that video that you saw where I panned across. And then last week I went into work and I was like, I need a, I need a picture to show people a note. And I was like, oh, this one will do. And I put it on my floor and I took a picture up against my file cabinet. So there you go. Um, okay, so when to repot. Most orchids that come from a commercial grower that you're buying at, um, again, you know, TJ's, um, Lowe's, Home Depot, the media in that pot is good for another like two years. You do not need to repot that orchid when you bring it home. You can just leave it in that. Um, for orchids that come like that, you know, from, from a commercial grower like that, I only repot if the orchid is falling out of the pot. They'll grow really tall like this, right? And sometimes they'll start to tilt toward the light and you'll just want to repot because the pots for you and you want to look nice and you don't want them like toppling out of their pot. Um, some people don't love all the air roots. You know, they want to tuck those the air roots are the roots that are right up here. So these are the in-pot roots, the former in-pot roots. These are the air roots right here on this plant. And they don't like them sticking out everywhere. They think it's kind of ugly. Um, the plant's doing a lot of growth with those air roots. I usually say leave them if, you know, you can, you don't mind how they look. But if you really want, you can um, soak them so they're soft and then you can repot your plant and put them inside the pot. They, the, the orchid, Phalaenopsis orchids make air roots when they're really happy and you have enough ambient humidity for them. And so keeping them around is like a great thing. It means that your environment's really good and it's telling you that when your orchid, your air roots shrivel up, you don't have enough humidity in the air. So I'd like to leave them, uh, but, you know, some people are like, they're ugly. And so it doesn't really hurt the orchid to get rid of them, but um, if it's happy, it'll just keep making them. Um, if the media has decomposed and then there are no air holes. So what happens with bark over time is it becomes soil. Um, sphagnum moss will also become soil, but most freshly potted orchids, they're not freshly, but they've been in those pots probably about a year or so, six months to a year before they're sold. Um, those, those, that media is good for another year to two years sometimes. Uh, usually the sphagnum moss is good for two years. The bark is probably good for another year. Um, you don't need to repot it right away. But if you look in your pot and it really looks like um, the bark, you know, you don't see any bark chips anymore. It's really soft and crumbly. Then it's time to repot because then when you water that like soil, like you know, the bark that's become soil is gonna basically smother the roots and you don't want that to happen. Um, it's different whether you're growing in bark or you're growing in moss. If you want to grow in bark and you wanna water more often and your orchid came in moss, sure, go ahead and switch it to bark. You know, the pot is for you to make it as convenient for you as possible. You know, if you don't wanna water as much, 
then, and you want it in moss and it came in bark, go ahead and switch it to moss. Orchid can handle it. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to repot while your orchid is blooming. This is the easiest way to make all the flowers fall off. So if you want to enjoy your flowers, wait till it's done blooming. Even if the spikes are still green like this, then you can repot. But don't do it while you have flowers on it because you bought it to enjoy the flowers and not the green leaves. Then just wait. So, um, okay, a little talk about um, when you're repotting, what to repot it into. Um, you can put it in a pot, but in the wild, so this is a fail, this is a species Phalaenopsis orchid, Phalaenopsis deliciosa at the Bahali Reserve in India. And you can see it's just stuck to the tree and you can see its roots are growing right here along the trunk, right? And it is just right there against the tree. And it's really happy like this. So in Florida where people have, you know, tropical like weather, people will take these orchids They'll take twine or string and they will just tie them to their tree trunks and then the orchids will attach themselves and they'll just leave them there all the time. Your orchid does not have to be potted upright. It can be potted angled to its side. It can, you know, like a lot of people will grow orchids, what they call mounted on slabs of wood. Um, it can be very, very decorative. You don't have to grow it in a pot. You just have, if you grow it mounted like this, then um, you have to basically water that orchid like uh, every day. So most people, unless you're really serious about it like I am and you're willing to spend hours every day watering, um, you know, people don't grow mounted, um, but you know, the people will grow these in slat baskets with moss. They will, you don't, you don't, you are not limited to the pot is what I'm trying to say. So again, you can see right here, I have mine in pots at work because um, I can't uh, deal with having, um, basically, I can't, my, my workplace would be really mad if I took a sprayer and hosed down my windowsill at work. Uh, it would also ruin all my papers and they would really, really hate that. And um, I just, I fill up the, the pots right here and you can see I have staked, um, spikes that are that are spent. Um, I clip them to make them however I like it. You can see I have them just, I have them lightly potted right here with moss uh, because I water my orchids right now during COVID every 10 days. Um, I'm only going in intermittently and I don't have time and so I just don't water them all the time. So all of mine are in moss. I, I transferred all of my stuff out of moss, um, out of bark if they came in bark and they're all in moss. Let me see what else. And that that's how I grow them for my greatest convenience. And all of these, I don't think I repotted any of these when I bought them until I'd had them like three years. I let them go as long as possible to enjoy all the blooming. Um, finally, if you want to get out of growing, you know, getting orchids from TJ's, you can get a huge variety of phalaenopsis and other types of orchids at one of the biggest um, orchid nurseries um, in the US. And it happens to be right here outside of Chicago. It's called Orchids by Hauserman. It's in Villa Park. They are great. They're great for the hobbyist. They're great if you just want different kinds of phalaenopsis. Um, this is a display right here. I took this picture in January. You go there in January and this is what it looks like inside. It's pretty fun and it's warm. It's great. Um, and they have I hope they have it this year. They have this open house at the end of February and they have like just tons of orchids and like a raffle where you can sign up for a free plant and then they can mail you like brochures and stuff. Um, and then finally, like I said, I do not grow uh, Phalaenopsis at home. Um, so those ones you saw at work. At home, I grow Cataleas, which are a completely different kind of orchid. Um, I have 400 Cataleas in my house. You can see they come in different colors and different shapes. Um, I also grow um, Miltasias and I grow um, Dendrobiums. I grow a lot of different kinds. Um, and, and they all take different um, 
growing, I don't want to say different growing condition, but different methods for growing them. And I didn't cover any of that today. I covered one type of orchid, the phalaenopsis, and how to grow it really, really well. Uh, and also finally, uh, if, if you want to see more orchids, I hope this year the Chicago Botanic Gardens will be having their orchid show in February. It usually opens uh, Valentine's Day weekend, and then it runs until the end of March. And during that, usually in the second week of March, the Illinois Orchid Society will have our spring orchid show, where we'll have between 15 and 20 exhibits by other orchid societies in the Midwest, as well as um, vendors. Um, we'll have probably around 10 vendors will sell different kinds of orchids and you could really have your mind blown. I love it, it's great. So I hope that everyone learned something and I got to show you a whole bunch of my orchids. <laughs> wow, Am amazing. Um, that was like incredible. And I know we have an audience here who has been sitting on the edge of their um, seats with some questions. Um, but first, I want to just thank you, Kay, for sharing your passion with us. I mean, I know you have kids, but these are your babies. And well, we okay, no, I mean, I love my orchids, but I'll have to admit that it's like kids, and then it's pets, and then it's orchids, because I have a cat, and um, he eats my orchids, and I still have him. So I have to fully admit that I love him more than my orchids. Okay. But Sometimes it's hard, especially when he's got a mouthful of plant and he looks at me and then he spits it out. He's like, <laughs> he's a little jerk. That is hilarious. Well, I'm just so impressed and I'm astonished that we haven't crossed paths before, um, having lived in Oak Park and, you know, being a, 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 a gardener myself, but um, I do not, um, I do not know how to do orchids. So this was a great education for me. And um, I didn't really cover repotting in full because Kayla said I should come back and do a second talk on that one. I was like, that should okay. be like an in-person demo. So I okay. think we're hoping, hoping um, that in the spring that we'd be all be able to be vaccinated and get back in person and I could yeah. do a live demo. I think we have, you know, there's, there's a demand for it. I mean, people are very interested in how to get it right. And they're, they're, I love how you kind of alleviated some of the worry that, if you failed with this one plant, it is not the end of the world. That doesn't mean you're not able to grow plants at all. Just go try it again and try something else, move it to a different spot, you know, change the way you're watering it, all of these things. Um, once you figure out something might work, then go with that. But I think that there's like this fear sometimes that people are, um, you know, I'm not a green thumb because I killed this plant, but I like your spirit of, you know, go try it again. Um, I feel like 500 orchids. Okay, there you go, problem. guys. There you go. Um, Kayla, do you have questions that have been coming in that you'd like to um, pose to Kay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first, uh, there's a bunch of questions about watering. So maybe let's start on that okay. topic. Um, so let's say you're watering just tap water from the sink. Do you have to let that water sit for a bit and let any, um, you know, chemicals? So, all right. So people like, you know, um, orchids do best with pure rainwater. I'll say that. All right. Um, but the, we in Oak Park are very lucky to receive Chicago water, which means that we have Lake Michigan water. You can right, and I, I've not won that, but they send you once a year what's in your water. You can write the water recommendation district or you can go on their website and you can find out what's in our tap water. And it turns out that Lake Michigan water is amazing for orchids. So anyone who gets Lake Michigan water, you can just give that water directly to your orchids. You don't have to do anything. I usually recommend don't give it like in the winter, don't give it freezing, freezing cold water. Right. And don't give it like boiling hot water, you know, like put your tap sort of like a little bit in the middle. So it's a little bit mixed. But Lake Michigan tap has got the right salt content. It's got the mo it's it's just perfect. And you can all those orchids that you see that I have at work, they get non potable canal water from down there. I don't put any, they don't get, fer I have a little bag of fertilizer there and it's been there for like eight years because I forget to fertilize them. They never get fertilized. You can fertilize your orchids that will help them grow faster, but um, it won't necessarily make them bloom more. For Phalaenopsis, blooming is determined by temperature, not by fertilizer. 
and size of your flowers determined by genetics and how much water you gave it, not the amount of fertilizer. What the fertilizer is going to do is going to make the leaves and the roots grow better. So it will give you more robust flowers. You might flower a little bit longer, like closer to the six month mark than the three month mark, but you don't need fertilizer to like all those blooms that you saw in that one picture, no fertilizer, no for all the pictures that you see that right here at the end, uh, at the end, no fertilizer. You don't have to fertilize it because Lake Michigan water is amazing. Now, if you live out in like DuPage or Lake County or any of those, they have um, well water and they need to purify because the salt content's too high. And uh, when the pH and the salt content is too high in your orchids and they don't uptake nutrients. And basically, um, even if you give them fertilizer, they don't uptake it. Uh, orchids need to have water pH that's between um, six and seven. They want it slightly acidic, um, which is basically uh, uh, Chicago water is 6.5 to seven. I measured it and no, it's great. So if you live in Oak Park and you're watering Oak Park, you don't need to do anything. <laughs> okay, good to know. Cause there's a bunch of questions about fertilizer. Let's say you do live in a place that you've had to filter your water. Um, is there a fertilizer um, that you, not a brand obviously, but a type of fertilizer that you recommend? So you can use, so what happens with orchids is that if you give them a fertilizer that's high in nitrogen, they'll mostly do vegetative growth. So like if you do the miracle grow like 15, 30, 15, they do a lot of vegetative growth. Um, for most people who grow orchids really seriously and they wanna grow orchids, they do a balanced um, fertilizer at a low strength. Um, a lot of people use this stuff. It's called at Michigan State University makes a, um, a formulation. Everyone will just call it MSU, right? It's the MSU formulation. You can like, just Google for it and there'll be like lots of companies that make the MSU formulation. And then you want to get their tap water version or they have a well water version. But the most important for all of those is they're going to, you're going to want to have calcium and magnesium added to your fertilizer. So calcium magnesium is what lets orchids photosynthesize. And then what you, they, the MSU comes in a formulation that um, does not have sulfates in it. So what happens is that if you mix calcium and like, so you get calcium sulfate, it's insoluble at the wrong, at, the, at a high pH. So they make it with, um, it's a nitrous ammonium, um, derivative of, of magnesium and calcium. And so the, the, it's, it's just basically more available. So that's, that's like the number one. So if you're going to do it, um, people will add um, a fertilizer called CalMag, which is basically calcium and magnesium as um, a nitrate um, formulation instead of a sulfate formulation. Um, and when you add that to your purified water, you want to make sure that your pH is already in the six to seven range before you add your fertilizer. If you have well water, right, and the pH is too high and you add like the MSU, it will just precipitate out. So it's important to make sure that your pH is at the right um, level first, 6.5 to seven, you add your fertilizer to the mix, right? You mix it, you pH it again to make sure it's still in there because your pH has gone up after addition and then you give it to the orchids, they're not gonna uptake it because pH will be too high. So that's the thing about adding fertilizer. So here in Oak Park, when I wanna add fertilizer, I just add it right to my tap water. It stays at the right pH because remember like Michigan water is awesome. And then I just pour it on my orchids. The other thing that orchids do really well with is like trace minerals. So they're epiphytes, they're growing up in the trees. They're only really getting fertilized in the wild but like birds pooping on them and stuff. And so they do enjoy getting some trace minerals. So like cadmium, molybdenum, very, very small trace amounts. Um, a lot like the MSU formulation, some of them have trace mineral in there. And so you can just buy it, it's already all in there. It's in a formulation that's more readily available. When you add it to water, it's not gonna precipitate out because there's no sulfates present and you just give it and it's all very happy. Um, but yeah, I would, you can't, I can use Miracle Grow here. I have used it, I've used the Bloom Booster here. Um, 
you want to use it then like a quarter strength, it works all right. Um, the things that, like I said, um, orchids really run is calcium magnesium. Some people like to use um, Epsom salts, which is magnesium, um, I think sulfate. And, but the problem with that is you can't mix it with any fertilizer because that sulfate will make everything else precipitate. So, um, you know, people will crush eggs. You can do that. You can take um, eggshells and you can add a little bit of acid to them to dissolve the calcium and pour it on. That's all great. But you just have to make sure that whatever way you do it, there's no sulfates present. It will precipitate right out to um, an, in, in a, a, an unavailable, insoluble form for your orchids. Gotcha. That's great. Thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit, can we talk about mealybugs and gnats? Okay. So um, fungus gnats grow in your medium and there's nothing really wrong with them growing in your medium. If you really want to get rid of them, um, you can try those little sticky traps with them and you can, um, or you can just repot into completely fresh medium, which will usually get rid of fungus gnats because they're growing on something that's decomposing in your medium. But fungus gnats are not dangerous. Um, you can also, a lot of orchid growers will also get like sundews and they'll grow them with their, um, or butterworts and grow them with their orchids um, to deal with fungus gnats. Mealy bugs are a completely different problem. Mealy bugs, they are soft shell, they're like not soft, but so there are several different pests that really grow orchids. There's scale, there's mealy bugs, and um, usually spider mites. And all of those are really, really destructive on your orchids. Um, scale requires a different treatment than mealy bugs and spider mites, which are soft. They have, and so if you want to stay with the organic method, um, insecticidal soap works. Um, also, uh, horticultural oil will work like neem oil if you want to do it. I don't like using either neem oil or horticultural soap because you need to constantly apply it. If you apply too much sun to either of those, you will burn your leaves. And so um, I don't like to use them because of that, because you have to apply it all the time. Um, for mealy bugs, I actually go with the hard kill. I use a neonicotinoid um, uh, uh, system, systemic insecticide, same thing that kills bees. Um, I totally garb up, I wear a face mask, I wear goggles. Um, I change my clothes afterwards. I do it on a day that it's not windy and I close spray everything with it to get rid of mealy bugs. Um, the problem with mealy bugs is that when you uh, use insecticidal soap or horticultural oil, it's supposed to smother them. But what happens is that they will lay eggs in your medium and they will come back. And that's why I use a systemic. Um, you can control it with insecticidal soap and horticultural oil, they do work for general control. But if you want eradication, I completely 100% recommend going with a systemic insecticide. Do it. Um, you will drive yourself crazy trying to kill them otherwise. <laughs> um, spider mites are actually much, much more simple. Spider mites don't like only grow when it's really hot and dry. So if you have spider mites, then what I usually recommend is raise your ambient humidity. And also if you have a kitchen sprayer, just spray your orchid with it a couple of times and the spider mites will go away. So they're just much easier. But um, mealy bugs are awful. Um, and, and scale is like the same thing. So if you get scale, I, I systemic insecticide. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, so quickly, when, when growing your orchids, um, which direction window is the best and how far from an outside window should the orchids be? So if you have an Oak Park house, which I will assume that you have a single pane interior window and then a storm on the outside, I recommend that you pick an Eastern or Southern window so the, the light's coming from the south or the southeast, and then you put that orchid right against the window, right up against the window. Um, you're only gonna get about four hours of light from an eastern window around here before it travels around to the other side of your house. Um, in the winter, that southern window, you'll get 
you know, maybe five hours, but you're just not going to get more light than that. And that is plenty for the orchid. It's not going to burn from that much sunlight, believe it or not. Um, it will burn if you stick it in a Western window. So don't stick it in a Western window, a Southern or Eastern window, stick it right on your sill, right up against the window and leave it there, especially in October and November. So it can get that 10 degree difference. But I, if I can't, if I, the only reason I don't have mine right up against my windows is that I have really, really small sills and I have jerk cats that will come by and push them off. But if, if you can, put them right up against it, that they, they, they like it and they will do great. And I do have a couple like that where up, up high where my cats can't knock them off. Awesome, cool. Um, so I know that we'll, we'll definitely have another talk, especially about repotting, um, but just briefly, is there, I know you talked about moss, you talked about bark, um, for just the average home orchid, is there a ratio? Is there something you recommend? Is there types that you recommend? And also what is the best kind of pot to have? So, okay, so for potting mix and moss, I really recommend don't use that stuff that you get at Home Depot or whatever. Go out to Hauserman's and buy their mix. They make a potting mix that is perlite, fir bark, and sphagnum moss that is good for just about everything. They also sell Chilean sphagnum moss that's 100% pure. When you put it in sphagnum moss, you can put it into 100% sphagnum moss, right? And it will be fine. Chilean usually lasts about two years. If you're willing to spend more and pay five times as much, um, you can get New Zealand long grain sphagnum moss, which is actually the moss that I use. It's just really hard to get it right now because of COVID um, and it's super, super expensive. But um, like long grain um, New Zealand sphagnum moss will probably last four to five years and you can just pack it in. Um, you don't have, you know, you just put it in. It naturally, when it dries, will make air holes. Um, long grain New Zealand sphagnum is like amazing. It's like gold. Uh, I, I highly recommend Phalaenopsis potted in that, but it's just harder to get right now. But Hauserman sells, you know, like kilo bags of the Chilean and they sell the, 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 the bark mix. And I would just recommend going to them and getting theirs. Don't use the stuff that has charcoal and whatever that um, you can get like from Orth, like, you know, that they sell like, you know, in the Home Depot potting mix section. Don't do that. Okay. Is there a best type of pot to have? Um, so no. So the best type of pot is the pot that you want in your house. Um, I usually recommend that if you're going to, if you're a big heavy water that has drainage holes on the bottom, you put a saucer underneath. Um, what I have a tendency to do because I like to display my work and I move them around is I grow them in just a, a standard like green azalea pot or any kind of like just dark covered plastic pot. And then um, I take that pot and I put it in one of those decorative ones with the holes and I hide how ugly my pot is. And that's it. Um, I also grow uh, my catalayas and what's this, it's a, it's a um, inorganic method called semi-hydroponics. And I'm not gonna cover that because it's a specialty growing method that takes different kinds of watering and you, they don't make pots for it. So I make my own with like deli containers, but it's like a whole nother talk. So <laughs> I'm not covering it, but um, no, like, so those plastic squishy ones that come inside work just fine. Um, they make, people make ones where they punch holes in the side with like a hot nail and stuff so that there's more airflow it will truly actually make no difference. If you let that orchid grow air roots out the side, it doesn't matter how many holes are in the pot. Remember, the pot's just so you can put that orchid in your house. That orchid would be totally happy if you stapled it to a, a piece of wood and hung it on your wall and just made sure that you watered it every day. Um, your walls might not appreciate it though, but the orchid would be totally happy. So there's no best pot. The, whatever works for you as a pot is the best pot. That makes sense. A um, few more questions. How do you determine the difference between a, a root and a brand new flower stem? So a root when it's coming out is round and a new flower stem coming out is flat. That's really what it is. So like the top of it will be kind of squashed flat if it's a flower stem coming out. And if it's a root coming out, it'll be perfectly round. Um, 
I would recommend looking at it with a magnifying glass. I used to say, just look, but I'm now old enough that unless I have my readers on, I really can't tell the difference. Um, once they're about a quarter inch long, you should definitely be able to tell. But when they're right coming out, you know, readers, because it's hard. <laughs> Um, that's great. Um, maybe just we'll do one more question and then um, if there's anything else people can kind of open up. Um, but, you know, you did have that really nice picture where you had cut, you know, at that node, right, the, the difference between the, the last flowering node and the unflowered mm -hmm. node. Um, what do you do if there's more than one stem on the plant? Is, can you treat them independently or is there something special? You treat special? them independently. You can just leave them all on. A lot of breeding has gone into um, Phalaenopsis. And so now that they have ones that are called multi-floral. So they'll grow up and they'll branch. And literally, if you take one that's branched and has like three or four branches on it and you cut all of them like right before the last flowered node, they might all branch again. And sometimes you'll do that and only two of them will branch and two of them won't. You'll have no idea why, but they, they will make their own decisions about that. But it, unless the stem turns completely brown and dries up, you can leave it and just cut it at the last flower. If it completely dries up, then you can just cut it at the base, at the bottom. Awesome, great. Yeah, if there's any other questions, people wanna, you know, it's 804, people wanna come off, off mute and ask anything or, you know, but thank you so much. That was really, honestly, that was, it was a great talk and you really, you can really tell that you obviously just really love these guys and really I just do. know so much. You just, you're just such a wealth of knowledge. So I really look forward to more talks in the future. Well, I hope so. I want, I, you want, I want to get more people growing orchids because that's, it's fun. It's great. Thank you so much, Kay.